Hi, this is Ken Moore with Local Matters. Welcome to the show. Well, there's a new minister in town, and I happen to know about this minister because she's a minister of my church. I go to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in McMinnville, and we recently hired Reverend Margot Reinhardt. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me, Ken. Well, you're such a great addition to the community. I thought they should know about you. And maybe a little yeah. bit more about what we do at the fellowship. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I am enjoying every minute uh, uh, that I've been in McMinnville. It's been great. Well, this isn't what you signed up for. We used to went on a minister search. There was no COVID going around the world, but that happened. And here you've landed in this um, kind of lockdown, more or less different varying degrees uh, situation. How do you adapt it? How has that impacted you? Um, well, I would say yes, both as a person and, and as a minister. Um, I think personally, I, I think I, I've had the same quest as everyone else about how, we you know, when we were in phase one of sheltering a place, it's like, how do you not feel completely isolated? How do you not feel cut off from all the things that you yearn to do and love to do and people to see? And uh, so that was a process of just coming to enjoy quiet more, learning how to get more sophisticated with video chatting, uh, returning to the telephone, you know, before we just text it all the time. Um, and, you know, finding, finding meaning um, in small things and, and um, sort of professionally as a minister, as you mentioned, um, when I was uh, going through that process with McMinnville, COVID was really, it, it was, it was starting to show and there was, we could, tell we were headed for a shutdown and it was really then about how do you reach out to people in faith community and for us that's unitarian universalism but how to to keep those bonds of of our values and uh, our life in in action uh social justice work and how to help people move from again from that in-person and sometimes much more casual format uh, to figuring out how to how to work Zoom. I mean, that was a big, any kind of video conferencing was a big learning curve for some people. Um, and to just kind of trust that sometimes the two dimensional space like we're doing here um, can have um, care and love and familiarity and, and still bring a message. Um, That's beautiful. I that's why you're a minister. When you speak, I feel good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's back not up. That er, not that every day is lovely and joyful, right? There are still the there are still the tantr temper tantrums days where I go, I can't take one more day of this, right? <laughs> well, let's back up a little bit. What uh, my favorite question lately is, uh, what were you like in high school? How did this? How did you evolve to be who you are today? Where did it begin? Yeah, I. Uh, I, part of your ministerial formation process, you actually do a fair amount of thinking about this and writing about it. And one of the things that I really looked back and discovered that I knew at the time, but I don't think I, I named it quite so clearly, is um, kind of this thinking about um, people who have to struggle uh, in their work, people who have struggled to find good living situations, um, the background is my mom had um, some illnesses when I was a teenager that it meant she couldn't go too far from home. It didn't mean she couldn't see people, but, but a lot of the things we used to do weren't possible for a while. And my dad worked on the railroad and it, it really in the railroad yards and he had become the union representative. And um, for the first time in our, in our household, my father purchased a handgun and it was locked in a drawer and the ammunition was kept out locked in the glove box in his car. And I came to this awareness that he purchased the handgun after becoming a union representative for the working class people in the rail yard. And he would only take it to work. It was never accessible at any other time. And my mother used to, my mother and I together would 
um, edit and type up the union minutes. So my mother was an excellent editor. So she would take my father's, would bring home the minutes um, and she would edit and I would sit at the typewriter and type. And at the time that it impacted me at the time knowing I was doing something incredibly important, but it wasn't until a little later that it, it really, um, it really gelled for me about my father being willing to take on that leadership position and yet there was risk involved. And I had heard him talking about that some of the union representatives had been beat up by uh, there been physical violence against them as they were leaving the rail yards um, from people likely hired by the railroad who didn't want the unionizing. And, um, and my mother feeling kind of, how can I support this effort? I'm not in the rail yard. I can't go with you to a union meeting. Um, and my wanting to do the same. It's like, how do we all pull together here? Um, and I knew railroad work was really, um, it's hard work. It was very dangerous. Um, there was a time where there wasn't good disability coverage. So if you were injured, it was just too bad. Um, and through that process, I mean, what I really took from that is no, no involvement and no gift is too small. Um, and that it really takes a team. Um, and I think that started to spill over in some other things in my high school life, just kind of noticing around the community, why do people have the jobs they have? And how do you get a job where you sit behind a desk versus where you're always working with your body? Um, and I grew up in a time where uh, as a young woman, as a teen, I was supposed to train to be a secretary. And I said, you know, I don't really think I wanna do that. I think I'm kind of interested in medicine or physical therapy or kind of like helping people get restored. Um, so I was a little bit of a rebel with that. I remember getting called into my uh, shorthand teacher's office and it's her telling me that my goals were I, I should focus more on what was before me rather than having these lofty goals. <laughs> wow, so that was transformational, that experience. And it sounds like yeah. your family of origin kind of led you to be this awareness and uh, yeah. letting, letting you know that you were, um, by modeling a powerful position in life, that you saw that that was possible. Yeah. And what and the other thing that was going on for me looking back is um, I think my, because of my dad coming from the south and always being very poor and then his experiences on the railroad, we talked about race very openly in our household, very openly. And uh, my parents would kind of ponder through what racial injustice looked like and meant. And um, yeah, I've really gone back to that quite a bit as of late how grateful I am that that was just an open subject in our house. You know, Reverend, this is just a wonderful experience for me to sit and chat with you uh, because of COVID and, you know, how kind of removed we are. I'm just kind of getting to hear these stories for the first time. This is... <laughs> That's <I'm> true. <laughs> just, I'm just delighted by this opportunity. Well, where was that? Uh, where did you grow up? Um, kind of a little north of Seattle. So... Um, kind of in a place that was going from being rural to suburban. It was kind of a slow shift. Um, and lived on a corner where a lot, a lot, the elementary school was across the street. So there was a lot of, always a lot going on with kids going back and forth and families going back and forth. And uh, eventually a pool went in. And so I always got to do a lot of observing <laughs> of what, kind of what was going on in the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, now I know I do know that you became a, a psychologist, right? Social worker. A social clinical, worker. Okay. Clinical social worker. Clinical social worker. So you you sat with people and talked talk therapy, perhaps. Is that a way to characterize what you did? Or yes. No? Okay. Yes, I, I you know I've done lots of different kinds of social work. I mean I've done child welfare, social work, family court oh. work, um, and also therapy. Um, saw mostly families going through changes. Um, yeah, and I did that for quite a few years, and 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 um, 
was so enriched by all those stories and um, helping people just helping people discover for themselves what changes they wanted to make and how they wanted to get there. You know, I often hear there's a burnout in some kinds of social work. I don't hear that from you. Um, why? Why not? Um, that is a great question. I think uh, probably because I did not stay in state sponsored social work. You know, those are the jobs where um, you're responsible for so many people and so many families. Um, and I, a lot of people probably don't know this, but when budgets are tight, what they do is they hire temporary employees. Well, temporary employees don't get any training. <laughs> and so um, I hope this is not still going on, but uh, so there you are in a job being responsible for so many things and people are so disenfranchised and then you don't have the tools you need. So um, I didn't stay in that system more than about five years. And Sorry. then I just picked up other creative elements, but I have incredible respect for people who career in those jobs. I mean, they give so much of themselves. And the other thing is, you know, I just had a kind of a rich spiritual practice life. And so at the end of the day, it was important to kind of be able to let that go and say, I've, I've really given of myself all day long and now it's my time um, to exercise or go to yoga or go walk down to the little stream and just really take care of myself a little bit. And how did you come to Unitarian <clears throat> Universalism? Well, that was part of taking care of myself. <laughs> so um, I moved from one community to another. And um, well, and I had grown up, I'll try to make this very brief. I had grown up going to church, even though my parents would describe themselves as atheists. And that's not quite perfectly accurate. I would say my mother is more influenced by mm, some components of Quakerism, actually. But they never went to church. God was not part of that dialogue in the house, but I craved it. I mean, I just craved it. And so I would walk to a community church um, who made just a really lovely space for me. Um, so then when I moved to this new community, it was like, I hardly know anybody here. I joined a gym, I joined a club, but I, it just, I couldn't find people who were thinking about what they wanted to manifest in the world on why they do what they do. Um, and so I thought, you know, go back to church, go back to my roots, just look for spiritual community. And, but I, I really, I had not been a Christian probably since probably the age of 19 or 20 since college time. And I thought, I'm not sure I can go to a Christian church because I do not want to hear the message that Jesus is the only way. I do not want to hear the hell message. I don't want to hear judgment. And I don't want to hear exclusivity. And um, so I just looked and looked. And one day I was <laughs> literally driving by this little back road. And I looked down and I saw the Unitarian Universalist Church. And I said, I am going there this Sunday. I love these people already. And what was so striking to me was it was clear they had an incredible relationship with the land that the church was on. They had some acreage, they had some beautiful trees. It dropped off to a, a salmon stream down on the bottom. I just happened to know that the stream was down there. And I thought these people have been very careful about how they put their buildings and where they put their child area, um, where the kids can be in the ferns and they can have a little uh, cubby tree house. And, and sure enough, uh, when I went there on Sunday, it was all about that. It was, how do we care for each other? How do we care for the earth? How do we bring voices to the table that are normally suppressed? So I went there Sunday and I basically never left. You know, it was, then I was on this committee and then I was on the board and then I was on the fundraising and then I organized the women's retreat. And um, I was just all in because everyone there seemed to be on a, 
a search. Yeah. Which I didn't realize later we had a principle for that. <laughs> There's a Unitarian Universalist principle to be on your personal search for, for truth and meaning. Well then, was what was the step like to think to think that I want to be a, a Unitarian Universalist minister? How did that come about? I think really starting starting to notice from being in leadership positions, I began to notice how is the church serving its members? How is the church serving the community at large? Um, and, and I started to think about how the social work and the mental health piece of it had been so important, but it was no longer enough. It's like, I wanted to delve more deeply. And, but in this, but the piece I brought with me is I want to delve more deeply but I also want to kind of lay out this feast of options where other people can delve more deeply and um, to explore in a safe place and in safe relationship. Um, and I was sitting at a board meeting um, during a, a complicated time. There was a lot of change going on in the church and policies needed to be reviewed. And it was, I, I don't wanna say, what do I want to say? There was acrimony. Let, I'll just be honest. <laughs> a church family is like every other family, right? There can, be, there can be big disagreements. And I was sitting there thinking for a moment, we have lost sight of why we're here. We are here to uphold one another. And we are up here to uphold ideals of creating voice and creating space and creating safe space. And, and, and it was like, there was a bit of a lightning bolt moment there. And, and my, my son was getting much older at that point. There was, there was some time opened up in my schedule. And I said, you know, I think I've been born to be a minister. I think I've been going to this for all this time. Um, yeah, and then I'm, it was just, just, yeah. I'm just chuckling because at one of the most uncomfortable moments in a <laughs> in a church meeting, you decide I want to be a minister. Yeah. Wow. I want, I want to remind people what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Well, you've come to um, uh, McMinnville and you've gotten to know us. You've been visiting personally with social distancing and masks and backyards and undercovers. And there's some concern about how's that gonna go when it gets colder. But um, the COVID aside, um, before and after COVID, you must have had some ideas of what you could bring to a congregation in general and probably form some ideas about what you can bring to um, our fellowship here in McMinnville. Can you talk about that? Um. Well, first, what I, I think what I want to say about it first is that um, from from the the moment I started meeting congregants from Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of, of McMinnville, um, I was so impressed just immediately um, about the how the leaders who are who were on what we call the search team were so careful to try to speak for the entire church. You know, to speak for certain people have more of this belief system and they want to have that nurtured. This other group has more of this belief system. Um, how would we work together to create programming for them so that they can explore and feel fed? Um, and just, you know, a, a pretty honest appraisal of where strengths were and where there's still areas of growth. And so for this leadership team to, to really hold up all those various opinions and needs. And, um, and one of the things that Unitarian Universalism is just, it's a hallmark for us is we don't all have to believe the same thing. And we don't really have dogma. It is much more about, we have a certain set of principles to be followed and to be on this search for truth and meaning and define that for yourself. 
Um, and then UUFM also had this component, um, which is also inherent in Unitarian Universalism, although um, more more as a more in the 1800s, and then as a very late, there was kind of some dormancy in between. But this idea of we have to look at people who live on the margins, and we have to look at people who um, are disenfranchised by economic injustice and racism, um, ableism, all, all sorts of things that try to make people other or try to push them to the side as we, as we see the world from, so many of us see the world from, uh, and our culture from this kind of white norm. Um, and UUFM is, has said, you know, we want to take a deeper look. We want to know what we're doing and not doing that might be causing harm, e even really quite inadvertently to other people, because that's not who we want to be. Um, so I was impressed from the get go. And then the more people I met, the more in love I fell with UUFM. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I felt courageous about taking this on with COVID. I knew it would be harder to get to know each other. I knew it would take longer to develop um, a ministry together, but I was quite confident we could do it because there's there's so much love and care and um, energy. There's yeah. energy for the work. There is love for you. I know that. And I feel it from you. Um, you know, a lot of us have said we're so grateful that we did start this process, made the decision to look for a minister. And especially now that we need that um, that light to kind of <laughs> um, gather us that when you have a lay ministry, um, you know, uh, there's not a one person that's kind of asked to see us and um, see how we can be called, how we can be um, uh, raised, I guess, as a, as a way to look at it. How do you think about that, Reverend? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. That you're not one of us, that you are, <laughs> you are other. We call you Reverend. Uh, okay. We don't call anybody else reverend. <laughs> this is true. It is my and, profession. <laughs> and you are, like you said, you're not, you're not one of us. And we are, you're hired pretty much to be an outside look at us um, as, as, as a congregation, as individuals. And to, um, from your experience, from your training, from your experience, in, in, I just think you have such broad world world experience and then also um, quite a lot of compassion individually that you can can lead us in a way that one of us one of the member congregants could not do so I, that's what i was looking for in, in a ministry that it wasn't up to me to um, rally people to a higher plane and they look at me and say well you know who, who are you by the way uh, <laughs> <laughs> who are you to be defining this higher plane? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So, how does that land with you? Does that does that make sense? Um, it does. I'm not quite sure which route to go down. I mean, I think it's it's true that what a minister brings is they they bring resources they bring and then the minister is kind of the link between our, our the larger denomination that of course has evolved over centuries um to people in the congregation it's like how are we still connected to our history um and one of the pieces about that is our history of course as unitarians um was that the church meet not be hierarchical that the church not be full of dogma, that we not be beholden to uh, a body that tells us what to think. Um, and so I think when the minister comes in, there is a very fine dance between um, looking at everything that's going on with the congregation. It's like, what do you value and why you're doing these things, but let's pause and ask ourselves, why are we still doing these? They still fit for us. 
um, or do they need some adjustment? I mean, I just think about um, the social justice work. Um, do we want to work on more on racism? Do we want to work more on climate change and environmental um, concerns? Do we want to have more of a focus on immigration rights? And of course, you know, the suffering is so great. We want to do everything we can. Um, and so I think it's it's helping the con in the congregation sort out what what avenues are we pursuing? You know, what what are we talking about on Sunday morning? How is our worship put together? And what are what are we trying to? I keep going back to feeding. What are we trying to feed? Um, and then really, how do we outreach um, to the community? I think is part of the minister's job as well because I am so aware. Um, Okay, I'm going to finish your question and then I'm going to shift to a different one. <laughs> so, um, so I think the minister is, is sort of at the hub of the wheel. And again, because we're not hierarchical, right? It's the hub of the wheel as opposed to the top down. I'm not telling the congregation what to do. I want to be in conversation with the congregation. And then my job is to kind of keep us in line with our mission statement and our goals and our principles. and. Um, and to have all those different components talk to one another. And one of those components is who are we as a UUFM in community outreach? Um, what I really learned when I did a chaplaincy internship for a year is this idea that we are looking for people who are looking for us. If there are people out there in the community who are feeling lonely or isolated during COVID, or there are people who want to belong to a community, but tr traditional, more, more traditional churches or Christianity perhaps does not work for them. It's, it's like we want to say, hey, we are here. Come see who we are. Um, come learn about the, the code by which we try to live and um, be on your own faith journey. Discover your own spiritual practices. Um, if you do not believe in God, there's a place for that too, um, or, or mm, God, divine, divine spark, um, to put it in a more Buddhist um, container. Um, there's still a place for that too. And I really, uh, when we work that into our worship, we just talk about this place in ourselves that allows us to feel compassion. And so we don't need to believe in any sort of deity um, or supreme order in the universe, we can just focus on what allows me to have compassion for myself and therefore for others. Um, so I just think our church wants to be, um, have an offering to the community. If we're here for you, um, yeah. We have small groups, we have a book club, we have <laughs> Sunday morning worship, we have simplified services um, on the second and fourth Sundays, which are much more about like, grab your cup of coffee. And we have a short speaker program, but there's lots of dialogue. There's lots of being able to ask questions of one another and of the speaker, um, which is just a more relaxed atmosphere. So there's really is, you know, we try to have something for everybody. Um, well, I know that um, you're about to start a book study i think it's uh, how to be anti-racist and anti-racist is that it yeah it's ibram it, the book group is on ibram kendi's book of how to be an anti-racist and when um, will that do you have a date for that when will that start november yeah okay. november and our, our website is easy to find for people to get the details uh of, Indeed. And, and how to see our services on facebook they, right can because we we streamline on facebook yeah and if you do contact, uh, you'll get a link to the Zoom call if you want to participate on the Zoom call too. Right. All right. Well, you know, we're times times up. We. Uh, Time it's been great to get to know you better, and um, I wanted the community just to be aware of uh, what we have in you and in our fellowship. So thank you so much for being here today to do that. Yeah, and I just want to say to the community, you know, take take exquisite care of yourself. These are such 
stressful times with, with COVID and then all the anxiety about the election. Um, we want an election outcome that brings back rationality and <sighs> rationality and healing and a forward, a forward path that's not filled with hate and judgment. So, so take exquisitely good care of yourself because these are really difficult times. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Good afternoon.